Hi, my name is Mitch Tannenbaum, and I am the Chief Information Security Officer for Cybersecurity LLC, based in Denver, Colorado. Um, today, we're going to talk about the crime of SIM swapping. Uh, the reason why I think this is a good time to talk about it is that uh, it seems to be on a rise. We just were involved in a case where someone lost about $10,000 to a SIM swap attack, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get that money back or help them get that money back. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, you know, everybody gets to deal with the, the crime. So let's talk about what SIM swapping is and why it's a problem. So first of all, what's a SIM? A SIM is that little bitty card that's about the size of your thumbnail that uh, goes inside your phone that gives your phone its personality. Uh, it has a software serial number on it, it has some other information. And it's the thing that the phone company uses, whether it's Verizon or AT, doesn't matter who it is. Uh, they use that to identify your phone and tie it to your account. They use it to figure out where to send things like um, uh, text messages and phone calls. So if we look at how that works, um, here's an example of a SIM card and a phone. They give you this typically nowadays, they give you this this pointy thing that you poke into a hole in, in the side of the phone and out pops an empty tray. You pop in the SIM card that the phone company gave you and now uh, that particular phone is tied to your phone number and your account. Uh, that's also why, for example, when you change phones, uh, all you need to do most of the time is just pop the SIM card out of the old phone, pop it into the new phone, and voila, magic, the new phone is now tied to you. You turn it off, turn it on, and it now um, will receive your phone calls and your uh, text messages. Um, older phones uh, used to be that you could pop off the back and put the SIM card in the back, but the concept is the same, whether you put it in the side or the back. And now some of the newer phones actually have software-based SIMs, so there's no physical card. Again, the attack works the same no matter what you're doing. So. Um, let's see, uh, let's talk about the attack itself and how that works. So there's a number of minor variations to the attack method, but uh, the basic concept is, you know, you get a phishing email of some sort or a phishing text or someone on the phone or whatever, but in any case, they lure you to a fake website where they want to steal your credentials. Could be a fake social media account, could be a fake bank website, it could be an investment account, doesn't matter. So you then go to the this fake website that's controlled by the hacker, you enter your credentials, and let's assume that you have uh, um, used two-factor authentication. So then the bank or whoever it is will send you a text message back, and um, the hacker now has their malware on your computer, so now the hacker has a two-factor they log in and they steal your money. Um, a slightly different variation of that would be that the uh, attack go, takes you to a, a fake site, you enter your user ID and password, they store that for later use, they forward that transaction onto the real bank's website and you go on your merry way not realizing there's any kind of problem. Then what happens is later, say two o'clock in the morning, they go off and figure out how to socially engineer the, the phone company to give them a new SIM card uh, for your phone and, uh, or maybe they go into the office of the phone company the next day and uh, they'll probably do it late in the day when everybody's trying to get out of there, you know, a few minutes before closing. They'll probably be, you know, less likely to check things very carefully. Maybe they'll have a fake ID, like a fake driver's license that has your name on it, your address and their picture. So it all looks good. They're not going to spend a lot of time because uh, they don't get paid that well and they don't get trained that well and the turnover is horrible. So all those things contribute to the, the fact that they're not going to go do a very good job. And up until now, the phone companies have basically said they're not liable. So all those things involved in, in SIM swapping, let's see, let's see what the net effect of SIM swapping has been. Um, on the uh, on the user. So um, here's a, a case where um, AT&T is attempting to get out of 
a lawsuit where um, a, a cryptocurrency investor uh, lost $1.8 million, and that's enough to get everybody's attention, um, because uh, the bad guys were able to uh, do a SIM swap on this investor's phone and then reset the password to the cryptocurrency account and transfer money out of the investor's account into um, the bad guy's account. And then they did whatever they did to hide it. But, but the first step was that they compromised this investor's phone and got a, a password reset and were able to get access to it. Um, and the next thing that they're likely to do, if, if it wasn't the first thing, is they will go off and attempt to reset the password on your email. So now they have your text messages and your email both. Um, here's another case of um, hackers. And this, this particular hacker was a 15-year-old kid at the time um, out, living outside of New York City in, in the suburbs in Westchester County. And um, he was able to go socially engineer both the investor, Michael Turpin, as well as Michael's phone company uh, multiple times in the case of Michael's situation. And even though the phone company was aware that he was the target of a cryptocurrency attack, you know, a SIM swap attack trying to steal his cryptocurrency, they didn't do it. He lost uh, $24 million in cryptocurrency, a lot of money. And now he's suing his phone company for um, three times that amount. Uh, for $71 million. So, um, you know, that's a real problem. Obviously, I mean, I guess from one perspective, I'd love to have the problem of having $24 million for someone to steal, but I don't. Uh, but he did, and he lost it, and he's suing the carriers. So the question becomes, well, how good are the carriers when it comes to uh, detecting and resisting cryptocurrency stealing, SIM swapping? And it's not just Cryptocurrency is really stealing access. In the case where this person I was telling you about earlier lost $10,000, that was just they compromised the person's bank account password. And uh, then they issued some wires to wire out money to their account. And from there, they, they uh, sent the money offshore. So um, what these guys did is they did a, um, a test of five major US carriers to see how well they would fall victim to these individual attacks. And the answer is these guys fell victim uh, pretty well. Um, they bought uh, prepaid phone cards uh, with each of the five carriers for a total of, of 50 phone numbers, five for, uh, 10 each for five carriers. And then they um, created this, um, uh, you know, they made some phone calls and text messages to make the, the accounts look real. And then they posed as bad actors attempting to con the uh, phone companies into doing a SIM swap. Um, and, and the interesting answer is that even when they gave uh, incorrect answers to personal questions, or uh, they, would, uh, they could say they, they didn't recall the information they had used, uh, in many cases, the carriers, because they want to be customer friendly, they don't want to offend the customer, they don't want the customer to get mad. Um, uh, almost all the time, and I think it was like 80% of the time uh, in, in this particular test, uh, they were able to bypass the carrier's so-called um, security questions and get the carriers to go off and, um, and, and give them a new SIM. Uh, it even happened, uh, curiously enough, to a Twitter CEO, Jack Dorsey. Um, and and you know, one thing these guys do, I mean, it really depends on what their objective was. In this case, their objective was to embarrass Dorsey and Twitter, and they did a pretty good job of that. Uh, they used the uh, hacked account to um, post vulgar messages. So it really depends on what the agenda is of the particular uh, person. Now, you, you know, you, me, we're not famous enough that if someone were to put a vulgar message on our account, that more than three people would read it. So it's probably not a big problem from that perspective. But emptying your bank account, well, that's that's certainly a big problem. So um, at this point, the question becomes, um, 
There we go. Uh, you know, what do you do? How do you stop this? Um, some of the carriers are doing better than other carriers in terms of uh, giving you the option to secure it. Um, like uh, T-Mobile has a, a specific pin that you can request that's different from your normal billing pin um, to protect against SIM swaps. Uh, sometimes they'll create a password. Uh, so you just have to ask your carrier, you know, how do you protect yourself against SIM swaps? And if they say, oh, gee, it's not a problem, then you say, well, you're certainly willing to, uh, to give me something in writing that says, if there's any damage that I uh, ha get as a result of you telling me that's not a problem, you will pay for 100% for all that damage to make it good and, and do whatever you need to do to fix the problem, which, of course, they're going to say, oh, no, we're not going to do that. So you tell me it really is a problem. You just don't want to deal with it. So um, uh, you know that's that's what there is to do. Two-factor authentication is good. So if we're talking about the secondary accounts that they get, like from your bank or your investment uh, advisor or somebody like that, if they offer two-factor authentication, which uses an app on your phone rather than a text message, that's much better because the only way you can compromise that is if they steal your phone. So I recommend that you do that if that's an option. Um, you know, from your uh, email, you know, you're going to have to talk to your email provider, whoever that is, and see what options they provide. Most of these guys are really re resistant to providing good security because good security oftentimes uh, generates extra tech support calls, which cost them money. And if you remember back in the early 2000s, you know, Microsoft, uh, it finally caught up with them, you know, that they admitted that, um, you know, they set, turned off all the security features in Windows because if they turned them on, then people screwed things up and they would call them and they had to deal with it and they had unhappy customers and they had tech support calls they had to pay for and things like that. So, so you know, at some point until the pet might require uh, a law on the federal side to go do that. So if you have any more questions, please uh, reach out and ask. We'll be happy to answer them. Otherwise, stay safe and have a great day. Turnkey Cybersecurity and Privacy Solutions offers the complete cybersecurity program for small to medium-sized